My guest this week, Dr. Peter A. Kwasniewski, is an academic, writer, and speaker who specializes in the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas, someone you've probably heard of. He has taught and worked around the world and more recently helped establish Wyoming Catholic College, where he taught a variety of subjects and directed the choir and scola until 2018. His thought and writing is both celebrated and decried from various corners of the internet, but for my part, I couldn't find a single thing to disagree with him about as we spoke about music, and especially sacred music's role in prayer, worship, and liturgy. You can find him at his website, Peter Kwasniewski, and on his substack, Tradition and Sanity. So like I was saying, this this is an extremely important topic. I think almost anybody can agree about that. And we, we tend to get very passionate about it, obviously, because it, it will affect us one way or the other. We all probably have some kind of a preference when it comes to music in general, and especially as it relates to our experiences uh, in Sunday worship. Um, in, in looking at your book, and of course, we're going to be talking about your book here that you've recently published, which is Good Music, Sacred Music, and Silence. Um, I thought a good place to start would be to ask the question, why why do we have music at all at Mass? And this seems like a stupid question probably for most people because we've been so conditioned by the experience of always having music at Mass. We were raised, most of us, this way. Um, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a fixture of Mass. Why, why, would you, why would you call it into question? But the fact is we don't have to have music at Mass. Um, there's a long-standing tradition of there being um, spoken Masses or said Masses or low Masses, depending on how you describe that. So why, why do we have music at Mass? Was there always music at Mass? How essential is it? And, and why do we include it? Yes, I mean, that is the basic question. It seems to me that the simplest answer is to note that music uh, enables people to express feelings, um, emotions, uh, in a way thoughts too, that are too deep for words, that are too, that, that go beyond the reach of simply spoken language. Mm. Um, we tend to sing or make music on big occasions. We do it for, on tragic occasions. We do it when we're celebrating a festivity, when there's a marching band, we do it when there are dances, uh, when we do it at, like at a wedding, for example. So music is an elevated mode of discourse. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like to say that that the, the, the two most um, <clears throat> elevated ways to approach reality uh, and God as the supreme reality are silence, the silence of contemplation, and then music, musical exaltation. Speech is more pedestrian, you might say. It's more the everyday mode that we live in, right? When we're just talking to each other as you and I are doing right now. Um, and that's why if you look at something like the low mass, for, certainly for over a thousand years, there's been this low mass uh, in, the, in the Catholic church and still exists in many places. <clears throat> um, it, was, it was more of a softly spoken mass and much of it was in silence, right? Mm -hmm. So not just a garrulous, you know, somebody talking for a half an hour or 45 minutes. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and but but the norm, the norm liturgically for the East, all the way from the beginning until the present, and for the West, for most of its history, was the sung mass, the sung divine liturgy. Um, so this is, that's my beginning uh, of an answer to your question. I think it's interesting when we talk about the, the contrast between what music can communicate um, that that seems to exceed the limits of what speech can communicate, right? Um, and and of course, revelation itself is is sort of of that nature, isn't it? It's it's it, it exceeds the limits of what human faculties can access unless it is it is given to us in a way, right? So revelation tells us the things that we can't figure out on our own that natural reason can't solve on its own. These are the things of that only God knows that He reveals to us. And in a way, music um, it, it it sort of gives us access to ways of communicating and participating in that experience that that simply speaking doesn't. Uh, I think that that's kind of what, what you're conveying. And this, this has sort of a, a philosophical tradition even back prior to Christianity in, in, in classical philosophy as well, doesn't it? Right, exactly, yes. I mean, in, in the book I talk about Plato, Aristotle, the Pythagoreans, um, you know, they, they all talk about the importance of music in human life. It's importance in ethics, in character formation, mm -hmm. Uh, the music that we listen to and the music that we produce says something about who and what we are, um, which is why I spend a lot of time, as you know, uh, 
uh, arguing for why we need to listen to good music, that there is such a thing as good music. Yeah. There's well-written music, beautiful music, and there's ugly and badly written music. Mm. Uh, and these actually have ethical consequences. I think that that's where we're going to have a tough time persuading people. And, and this is this leads me back to maybe a question that was nagging me a little bit as I was reading your book is who who is it written for? Is it written for kind of the core, more traditional element within the church? Or are you trying to persuade anybody who considers themselves Catholic? Well, I, I mean, certainly I would I, I wanted I want anybody who's interested in the question of music. Uh, that is to say, good music sacred music and silence. I want anybody who's interested in those topics to read this book. Um, it's true that uh, I may not be able to persuade everybody. I know as a, as, a, as a university professor, I taught music for many years. And one of my goals in the classroom was to try to persuade the students to enjoy classical music. Mm. And, and you, know, I, you know, classical is a bit of a misnomer. I just mean yeah. all the music other than the pop music that's been written in recent decades, you know, which is that's a ton of music we're talking about. Folk music. We're talking about, um, you know, about uh, romantic era music, classical, Baroque, Renaissance. You know, Gregorian chant. I mean, this is yeah. this vast realm of music uh, that we can listen to, and most people listen to this tiny, tiny, tiny little portion of it that's been written in recent years, right? And right. and is written yeah. as you know at a level that really doesn't bear much comparison with the music of the past as well as the great music of the present. We can get to that, hopefully, in this conversation, because it's not just a phenomenon of the past. Mm. Um, so I, I try to persuade students to open their minds and hearts to this. And you know what? It works for a lot of them. It works. It's a, it's like a, a one-two punch. On the one hand, I try to give them arguments. And the arguments I give them are taken not from me. Who am I? Nobody has any reason to listen to me. But from Plato and from Aristotle, from Augustine, from Boethius, from St. Thomas Aquinas, from the popes, right? There are a lot of authorities out there, you know, reputable, awe-inspiring authorities yeah. who actually say the music you listen to is hugely important for your spiritual and psychological formation. Um, it can make you a better or a worse person. Mm -hmm. So that's the first strategy is to hit people with the authority. Uh, I mean, Nietzsche says that, Schopenhauer, people who aren't even Catholics, who aren't even Christians say this. And then the other prong of that, and the more important prong ultimately is experience. I, I would, in music class, I always immerse students in the music of the great composers. We listen to Tchaikovsky. We listen to Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. We listen to Mozart, Eine Kleine Nachtmusik. We listen to Bach, you know. Uh, I, I played them, William Byrd, Palestrina, all these great composers. And you know what? It takes time. But you, when you when you start bending your ear and you you let yourself be touched by this music, then it it begins to get under your skin and you start to to sympathize with it or you you have the basic sympathy that's necessary for for musical comprehension, and then I think people begin to enjoy it. And so one of the I'll just stop here because otherwise I'll go on too much. But I <laughs> uh, what I used to give the students the the Lenten musical challenge of go spend your Lent, your 40 days of Lent with a musical fast. Don't listen to any music. Mm. Um, just right. just pray. Just pray in silence. Pray your rosary. Go to Mass. But just try to live in silence. Take, take the music away from you. It's a hard fast for a lot of people um, because music means so much to us. Yeah. And But what I found, what's amazing is anybody who ever did this fast, when they came back to what they were listening to after Easter, they often felt disturbed by it or they felt uneasy about it because they had been away from it long enough mm. to, 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 to have a distance from it and to hear it as if for the first time and to realize, Oh gosh, that's those lyrics are kind of vulgar. And, and that, and that music, it's, it's very excitable. It's, it's making me kind of you know angry or it's yeah. making me, um, you know, it's pushing me around emotionally. I don't like that, you know, uh, and so anyway, I try to make people conscious of these things. Yeah, we get desensitized to our our habits and our and our, our our vices, even right. And and I think that people don't tend to think of beauty um, and things of maybe artistic consequence as being on the same level as something like ethics. I think every Christian can agree that there is there is right and wrong, there is good and evil. Um, and we have we have experiences of this with with respect to virtue. even even non-Christians um, that are heavily immersed in today's culture of relativism will still admit that um, 
there's a difference between someone who is fit and someone who is unfit, right? And a person who is unfit, we've almost all of us have gone through these periods of life where we've made grand resolutions. Oh, I'm going to get in shape this New Year's, right? And so we'll go and get a gym pass and we'll start hitting the gym. And it's it's punishing at first, right? It's very disagreeable to our constitution. And yet the more you do it, and the more you abstain from some of the things that compete with those habits, the more you'll start to grow an appreciation for it, right? And then suddenly, um, the more the more you do that, and then as you return to um, those older habits, perhaps, like um, as it, maybe you were to indulge or you skip going to the gym for a week or something, that that toxicity and that that incompatibility with the fulfillment of your humanity that you've ex experiencing as you cultivate virtue becomes much more apparent for you. Um, I, on ethics, I think that that's obvious to people. On questions of art and beauty, the same people, uh, the, uh, you know, people of goodwill, Christian people will often say, uh, yeah, that's just a matter of taste though. And you, how, how can you say that the music I listen to actually can have moral consequences for my soul, that it actually makes me a bad person or it makes me a good person? I listen to this or I listen to that and it doesn't make me any worse off for it. Um, but at the same time, the person who's in the habit of perhaps not exercising, might say the same thing. I don't need to exercise, I'm doing just fine. Until they realize what it looks like on the other side and they, they look back and they say, oh wow, that really actually wasn't very good for me. Right, well, let's, I mean, let's face it. Um, relativism is, that's the pandemic right now, is relativism. Yeah. Um, and it affects almost everybody, not just anymore in the aesthetic domain, but also in the ethical and the intellectual domains as well. Mm. Um, but to, to address your specific point, um, you know, really, there's this idea, this relativistic idea that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. It's very difficult to, it's actually difficult to sustain that position in the face of common experience. Mm -hmm. um, because in fact, most people have a sense that, most people have a sense of greatness when they encounter it. Um, I mean, this is the reason why millions of people go to see certain churches or certain monuments or certain museums every year, and they don't go and line up by the dumpster to look at the trash. I mean, right. it, you know, and yet there are modern artists who will put trash on display in a modern art museum, and some people will praise that. But see, for, for that kind of, I mean, there you can see there's actually kind of a warping that takes place with mm -hmm. some people's taste. Taste can be warped. Yeah. There is such a thing as taste, right? Um, and so, I mean, this may sound elitist, but... The real problem is that most people don't have enough experience of the arts it, it, to have to have be to be able to form good judgments about them, um, and that's why you know I I one of the things I do in in some of the chapters in the first part of the book is I give lists very concrete lists of pieces of music that people should listen to be, because I I wager you're going to like these pieces right these are pieces that have been popular with audiences everywhere around the world ever since they were written. Why? Because they have something objectively great about them. So mm -hmm. why don't you listen to them? Why don't you actually just broaden your musical horizons for a while and add these things to your playlist, so to speak, um, and see if you can't if you if you can't break open your soul to encounter a larger realm of expression or artistic expression, right? Um, I mean, look, Shakespeare is not easy to understand. And yet people still go to Shakespeare plays after hundreds of years, people still go to Shakespeare plays and they want to see the real Shakespeare. They don't want to hear some bodlerized version put into 21st century English. They want to hear Shakespeare, right? And it's because there's something about it which is irreducibly great. And that's the claim that I make about music too. It's not really that controversial a claim when you get right down to it. Yeah, I mean, there are different ways that you can use the word classical to apply to, to different things. We can use it to, to talk about cars, classic cars, for example, right? And I think most of, most people would look at like a 1958 Chevy and say, hey, that's a great looking car. I, I would love to drive something like that. Or at least when it drives by, it's going to turn heads and people will be like, oh, cool, that's a neat car, right? But let's say a, a 1990 or like a 1988 uh, Chrysler K car. Um, like a New Yorker or something like that, or a, one of their Plymouths or something. If that drives by, people are going to be like, oh, remember those? That's too bad, right? But at the time, they rolled it out with the, all the marketing fanfare, and people were like, ooh, this is new, this is shiny. Um, the difference between the kinds of sensibilities that are conditioning us in our tastes today, uh, which is all about just the new and the fashion and the current, um, compared to something that's classical, is just that it transcends a particular moment. 
and your particular appetites or whatever can tickle your fancy, right? A, a, a 58 Chevy will transcend from generation to generation. People will always look back at that and, and, and it will have something of merit to it. But the thing yes. that that you liked from 10 years ago that you look back at now and say, oh, why did I like that? Isn't that proof enough that it, the thing isn't actually objectively good? It was just something that we all got swept up in a moment where we thought this was good and it was actually just appealing to something a little more base than, than our highest intellectual ideals could, could, um, could grasp for. Yes, I think that's true. And, and I mean, the, you know, there is, there is a range. Um, when we're talking about anything to do with the practical side of life, when we're not talking about truth, mm. pure truth, the capital T, but we're talking about cultural expressions, painting, sculpture, architecture, music, poetry, whatever it is, there are fashions, there are changes in taste, there are periods. I mean, for example, as amazing as it is to us, in the 18th century, in 18th century England, Shakespeare was not, was not, uh, you know, uh, well well thought of he, he had a he, that was the low water mark of shakespeare's reputation and it only went up and up and up after that point because of the romantics the romantics you know similarly the enlightenment period they thought they thought that gothic architecture was awful it was dark mm -hmm. it was barbaric right yeah. um the romantics rediscovered the gothic that's why we had the gothic revival that led to so many magnificent churches and buildings like the parliament buildings designed by pugin in london right Mm. Um, so there are definitely shifts in taste, but what's interesting is that there are works that stand the test of time. Mm. Um, and, and, and these works, these works do deserve to be called classics. And there is a remarkable amount of agreement about them. example for music, right? What is it? What is, what is it that makes Chinese, Korean and Japanese piano players crazy about Bach and Mozart, right? Bach and Mozart have nothing to do with the Orient, with Asia, but some of our best classical musicians right now are from Asia and they love Western European music. I mean, I, I take that as a sign. It's not a sign of cultural imperialism. It's a sign that this music is beautiful. It's well-crafted, it's gorgeous. It, yeah. These composers knew what they were doing when they combined, when they exercised the art of combining pitches with rhythm, and with harmony, right? They just nailed it, okay? And that's why they're popular wherever there are people playing instruments, you know? Whereas, I mean, I, I don't mean to pick on any particular culture, but there's a lot of music that's been written in different indigenous cultures that isn't on the, isn't on the concert hall stage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think that's, that, again, that I, some people would say, oh, that's just because of this or that particular cultural force. No, I, I, I just, I don't think that's true. I'm a composer. I know what goes into writing a piece of music. And I know when I look, when I listen to two pieces of music, this guy knows how, how to use the art of combining tones. And this guy is an amateur and doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. You know? There's a line in, in the book that, that appears early on, and I think you were quoting somebody else, but it stuck with me as I was reading the book. And, and as I spent time just reflecting on this this topic in general, um, because I think for a lot of people, this this controversy, what we call the liturgical wards, or or, or just uh, the, the the debate about liturgical music or sacred music, doesn't go much further than new forms of music versus old forms of music, right? Like they don't have the the, the terminology or the, the the sort of fluency in the history of all this to be able to understand the nuances of it. So it, it, it gets about that far. So if it's just about genres or styles of music, um, this quote really, really stuck with me. And it was, it was that music doesn't lie. Um, we can try to make it lie. So you could take a, like a Metallica song. Like I was a big metalhead before I became a Catholic. Um, and I still, my tastes are still heavily conditioned by that. I, I've always been a Metallica fan, right? You could take a Metallica song and make it all about virtue and flowers and meadows and romantic things. And the only way that that would be appropriate is if it was meant to be ironic because everyone can tell that the music wouldn't fit the subject matter, right? The music does not lie. You know what I mean? Right. Right. So, yes, jump in if and, you want. And, yeah. I mean, one of the things that I argue against a lot, uh, and I, I mean, again, you asked me earlier, who am I trying to persuade? I don't know. I hope I can persuade you yeah. <laughs> at least, but um, I, 
you know, I talk about the fact that music has many different elements to it. It has the rhythmic element. It has the melodic, it has the harmonic element, and it has lyrics. I mean, that's at least four dimensions of music, and each one of them deserves its own attention um, in terms of how music communicates. Music is communicative. It's communicating a certain, I would say, I would describe it this way. It's communicating a certain state of soul or frame of mind or even condition of heart mm. through music to other people, to listeners. It's magical. It's mysterious. We don't yeah. know how does it happen? How yeah. can that happen? How can I, you know, how can I write a piece of music, a symphony, a sonata, an opera, or a pop song for that matter, that is so instantly effective in communicating what's in me to you, right? It's it's something, it's a powerful thing. Music is, is the most powerful communicating tool that has ever existed and ever will exist. Um, and, and so um, I, I point out that a lot of people, they, they kind of stop at the level of lyrics and they right. just say, okay, analyze the lyrics you know kind of like the moral majority back in the reagan era they were always like let's look at the lyrics and if the lyrics are naughty then we should have a label that says these are bad lyrics or whatever but what that misses is that the music itself is the more fundamental language right and that's exactly why your point is yes. true if somebody took calvin and hobbes you know cartoon strips and and then put and set them to puccini operas it would be completely ridiculous because there's a total disjunct or dissociation between the style of the music and the content of the text right mm -hmm. the music itself it like a puccini aria it's it's meant to stir you in a romantic way it's lyrical it's languorous it it kind of it it makes you it's sensuous right this is music that is meant to be almost seductive right yeah. um but then there's the heavy metal music uh which is often I would say full of irascible appetite, full of anger or angst. Um, and that's expressing the angst and the anger, even if there were no words to go along with it. Exactly. Right? And this is what I think one of the claims that played on Aristotle make, which is, which is, is so basic to this whole conversation is that the mood or emotion or feeling or passion, I think you can use all of these words that is, somehow in the music itself mysteriously but but really uh there that it it in it induces or creates a similar disposition in the listener so if i'm i mean it's not simplistic that is to say if if i hear a certain kind of music it may not create exactly the same mood in me as it creates in the one who performs it but there's going to be some kind of generic likeness I mean, and this is often why, you know, when people are sad, they 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 often enjoy sad music, or when they're when they're upset, they they listen to music of people who are upset, um, or if they're if I mean, you know, in the old films, the black and white films, if if the handsome, you know, uh, 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 actor wanted to put moves on the lady, he put on the seductive music in the background, right? I mean, this that is there's always this kind of desire to create a mood with the music. And it's that also explains why sometimes people who are sad they want to listen to happier music, right? Because they mm -hmm. want to get out of their sadness. You know? mm -hmm. So I think this is really indisputable. I, I think where a lot of people would feel the truth of of this principle, if they're not being persuaded yet, is uh, is in our movies, right? For those of us who like movies, uh, especially for Christians who like a movie like say The Passion of the Christ. Um, this is something I did in one of my, my earlier videos where I was talking about church music, um, where this, this hit home for me because I, I didn't have much of an education on sacred music at that point. I, I hadn't read documents like Sacrosanctum yet. Um, but I knew that there was something wrong with what was going on at mass and, and, and this analogy was effective on me. So I thought it would be effective on other people, but I took a scene from the last supper, um, from, from the passion of the Christ. And I said, take out the sweeping romantic cinematic score from that movie and put in just the, the backing track of a praise and worship song. So take the vocals out and just take the, the guitars, the bass, the drum, the piano, the keyboard, whatever might, you might have in that very percussive style of music 
and 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 swap it in as as the background music for that that scene, which is what I did because I, I have the the medium of YouTube and, and videography to actually do this to demonstrate the point. And it was ridiculous. It was absolutely absurd. It took something that was clearly supposed to elevate our minds to something great um, within the scope of human history, if not cosmology, and and reduced it to something so common and so silly, right, as the kind of thing that would be appropriate at a party. It's like, well, no, this is way more important, way more consequential than this music seems to be suggesting. So how then can we justify doing that as a form of prayer? It's just not prayerful music when you remove the lyrics that right. way. I agree. And I, I, you know, I need to watch that, that what you're just describing, because it's brilliant. What you just said mm. is a brilliant thought experiment. Um, and I'm so glad that you did it uh, because I don't actually, I'm not good enough with technology to, yeah, yeah. to do something yeah. like that, but that's, that's a very effective uh, approach. Mm. Um, you know, I, I think that I would, I just make this point. Yeah. Um, Catholics use to know what to do because they had an instinct for tradition um, because they thought what was always done is what we should keep doing. There's a reason why it developed in the first place. Our ancestors had wisdom that we may not have um, and an unbroken continuity of practice is something that is way more important than our opinions and our clever ideas. Sure. That's what I, that's what I call the principle of tradition. And it's, something that has broad application in human life, but I think we're talking specifically about the Catholic Church, which is the Catholic Church, it's distinguished from the Protestants by its sense of tradition, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not just scripture, it's scripture and tradition, and tradition not with a, not just with a capital T, but all the host of little t traditions that have mm -hmm. developed, you know, over the, the 2,000 years of the church's history. And I yeah. would even say 3,000 years, because I think the Jews, it, the Jewish worship into account as well. And right. so when you look at tradition, you, you you see the chanting, the solemn chanting of the liturgy is something that goes way back into the mists of antiquity. We can't even say when it began, but Gregorian chant, which is the main music of the of the Roman rites, and there's some similar kind of chant for every single traditional rite, Byzantine or Coptic or Malabar or whatever it is, they all have chant of their own kind. Um, this chant music has Jewish characteristics or Hebrew characteristics. It has Roman and Greek characteristics. So it goes all the way back as far as Christians have been worshiping. And this, the, the chanting is nothing other than a, you know, St. Augustine said only the lover sings. So it's the, the, the lover of the word of God, the lover of Christ, from the very beginning chanted the liturgy. And this chant somehow became solidified and consolidated and deepened over time so that it became this wonderful heritage that was carried down through every century. Um, and it has exactly the qualities that liturgical music is supposed to have. Right. So in a way, we shouldn't even really be having the debate, the liturgy wars about music. We should have the humility to say what's good enough for everybody else all the way back is good enough for us too. And we need to apprentice ourselves to it and attune our ears and be converted in our minds, as St. Paul would say, to understand why this is the right music for liturgy. Mm -hmm. We're going to say more about chant, but I want to I want to assume that our audience is still in the frame of mind of old music versus new music. And something I hear a lot whenever I address this this topic is people will say that old music, the kind of classical music that you like was new at one time and novel and there was probably conservative types back then who decried it as being um, incompatible and inappropriate um, so that's that's one thing but another another mood or attitude about this that would have been persuasive for me back when I was uh, the praise and worship leader at mass when I first became Catholic I had the guitar and and we had a whole full band and everything and God forgive me but um what I would have said to somebody um, if they had objected and said, you should be playing you know, more traditional forms of music at mass would have been, well, you know, older forms of music were more compatible with a very aristocratic age when there were these class uh, inequalities and high-minded people who didn't know what it was like to be common, much like 
the Pharisees, right? Because we have two types of people that appear predominantly in the New Testament. There's these high-minded, aristocratic people who like to wear long flowing robes and be seated in the places of honor. And they're very pious and they care a lot about the externals. But, and then there's the, the apostles and the disciples and Jesus himself who are working class, who are just like us. They're common people. And what would Jesus have listened to? He wouldn't have listened to classical music. He wouldn't have, you wouldn't have seen him at the symphony with all of these people with their powdered wigs and all of that kind of nonsense. He would have been in the tavern with the rest of us listening to a good rousing folk song of some kind where we're all stamping our feet and having a good time. Wouldn't, wouldn't he, wouldn't Jesus have sympathized more with what we consider to be more like popular forms of music today? Well, there are there are probably about twelve different fallacies in, in what you just said, but <laughs> uh, so I don't even know where to begin. Um, but it, it's it, you did a good job of presenting what people would say. So thank yeah. you for that. Okay, good. Um, well, so I mean, the the first thing is everybody cares about externals, right? So let's not be let's let's not let's not beat around the bush about that. I mean, even the people who want to play the guitars are very much about the externals. Mm. It's just about which externals and why are they important and why should we do these versus those. Um, yeah. And by the way, I used to be I used to sing the same kind of crazy worship music and I was and I even wrote a guitar song. So, I mean, you and I are not that far apart from each okay. other. You know, I, I had a long journey to get to the point where I'm at right now. I, I wasn't, you know, singing chant out of the womb, so to speak. <laughs> um, but but as far as far as go, the other thing is that there's this very there's this tendency of modern people to have a nice imaginative picture of what Jesus and the apostles were really like. Yeah. And they and they think about like the Last Supper as this vernacular community celebration. It wasn't that at all. It was a formal Jewish liturgy, partially conducted in a dead language, Hebrew. Nobody spoke liturgical Hebrew, but they were still doing the Passover in liturgical Hebrew, just like Catholics did the Mass in Latin long mm -hmm. after it was a spoken language. I mean, I could go on and on about this, but the idea that Jesus is just some kind of common fellow doing common things does not withstand any scrutiny whatsoever. Um, but even apart from that, I don't have a problem with folk music. Real folk music is is wonderful. It's a wonderful, authentic, beautiful, rich art form. But you have to look at real folk music. I mean, England, Scotland, Ireland, just to take those examples because they, you know, yep. we're, we, they're more relatable to us. That folk music, it's melodically interesting. The, the words are poetically beautiful. You know, the rhythms, the harmonies. I mean that if you want to listen to that kind of folk music, go for it. I don't care if you if you go to the classical concert, but at least sing and listen to good quality folk music, right? And not the mass-produced, commercially driven crud <laughs> that's on the radio station or on the or on Spotify. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other thing is people don't even think about how how commercialized pop music has become. And how much it's become like a form of propaganda where we have a certain message we're trying to sell, whether it's sex and drugs and violence or whatever it is. And we're going to sell that message. We're going to push it really hard because music is like a drug. It's so powerful. It's like a drug. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's, you know, this this is a fact as well. So let, let's make a distinction between folk music and pop music. There's a huge distinction there. Yeah, the modern uh, modern musical variety, they, they don't even really have much pretense about this. They call themselves the music industry, right? What, what does that mean? What does industry mean? Well, industry is, is the way that we, we, we manufacture products in the post-industrial age, right? We took this, this, um, this scheme or this format of, of producing products um, so that they could be produced quickly and efficiently and on a massive scale. Why? To maximize profits, right? So, so the music industry did the exact same thing. They, they created all of these systems to say, how can we crank out as much product as possible so that people will constantly consume it? Who among us would say that's the best way to produce art on a conveyor belt where it's just getting spat out as quickly as possible and, and then mass produced and mass marketed? I mean, who are we kidding? That's yeah. not quality art. Let's, let's not kid exactly. ourselves. Exactly. And that's why, I mean, if you listen to any good folk band playing live, I mean, and of course you can record them too. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm anti-recordings. I mean, the book, my book recommends a bunch of recordings that people should listen to to get yeah. to be familiar with the music. But when you listen to a really good folk band, then you know how the high quality that popular music can actually attain mm. and achieve. Mm -hmm. And I mean, again, in rhythm, melody, harmony, lyrics, just to take those four categories. Yeah. Um, but I want to address a different point that you brought up as well. And that is this. Um, 
Hebrew temple and synagogue worship was full of music and it was full of chanted music as well. We call it cantillation. Uh, and some of the psalm tones used in the Gregorian psalm tones are based on Hebrew cantillation melodies. There's good, there's good musicological evidence for that. Mm. So what Jesus and the apostles heard was a lot more like a Latin liturgy than it would be like any kind of banjeri or, or, or uh, uh, jamboree yeah. uh, session nowadays, right? Um, and you brought up this question about ar ar aristocratic atmosphere or courtly atmosphere. Well, let's not forget that the main paradigm for worship in Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, is a kingly, monarchical, aristocratic paradigm. That's the paradigm. God is the great king over all the earth. His court surrounds him. He has servants who do his will and bow before him. This is the basic image. So when we look at a solemn Latin liturgy and we see people bowing towards each other and we see genuflections and clouds of incense and chant, that's just the book of Revelation. Okay, mm -hmm. that's what that's what's there. So, mm -hmm. so if people, I mean, it's anyway, that's my response. Well, and, and while it might be true that, you know, at something like the, the wedding feast of Cana, our Lord may have... Um, he may have listened to a, a something that was more like a jamboree and and tapped his toes to it and enjoyed it in the context that it was in. But something that uh, gives me chills to this day when uh, when I think back to having first read this was in uh, Pope Saint Pius X's uh, Trilateral Institutiony, and hopefully we can spend a little bit more time with this as well. But in the opening section of it. He talks about, um, and he expands on this this concept a little bit more, but the difference between the sacred and the profane, right? And profane in this sense doesn't mean vulgar or something like that. It means ordinary or sort of the common common experience. And so we can apply that to music, right? Like folk music, um, or even if we want to, like popular music on the radio today would be considered profane music. Um, praise and worship and the kind of thing that would be in an, uh, a choral and praise or a breaking bread book is typically a profane style of music, as opposed to something yeah. that, that is sacred. Yeah, jump in if you want. Yeah, so I mean, you're exactly right. The word profane comes from la the Latin profanum, which means outside the threshold, i.e. outside the threshold of the temple. Mm. And the, the reason for this concept is that every culture, and, and in fact, every religion, you know, let's let's not even be, we, we can be even more than ecumenical, we can be interreligious here for a yeah. moment. Every religion has had a perception that whatever is going on inside the temple, inside the holy place, where you encounter the divine, that is different from what goes on beyond the threshold, profanum, outside in the world. There's something different. When you pass that threshold, you're entering from this world into another world. Now, this isn't that doesn't mean another world that is imaginary and cut off from this world, a form of escapism. It means the world that is more real, the world of God, the world that that in a sense is the archetype or the or the idea from which our world comes, right? Mm -hmm. And we're trying the whole point of religion, and I think we can make this anthropological claim. The whole point of religion is to is to reunite yourself with the ultimate principle of things, whatever, however you understand that. Mm -hmm. You're trying to reunite yourself. You're trying to come into communion with the ultimate source and end, perhaps, we could also say, of reality. And in order to do so, you need to purify yourself because everyone recognizes that I am not perfect, I am not virtuous, I am not whole, I, I am not where I ought to be as a human being. Um, you know, and, and once you have the notion of divine sonship, which Christianity brings in like no other religion, then you really feel like you need purification because I am not Jesus, you know, and yet I'm called to be Jesus. So there's a big process of purification. And when we cross that threshold and go into a Catholic church, we are literally coming into the presence of God because of the Holy Eucharist. Right? That ought to change radically what we do, how we dress, how we behave, how we, um, how we comport ourselves. Yes, kneeling and even bowing down on our face would be appropriate in the presence of God. If it's if you don't think when you come into church, if you don't have some kind of sentiment of reverence, or I would even say reverential fear or awe, then you are missing the point. You're absolutely missing the point. You're going there, but you're not aware of, of the one before whom you're going. Yeah. And so this is why all traditional sacred music is very otherworldly in sound. It's, it's meant to evoke heaven, 
It's meant to draw your mind to the attributes of God, his omnipotence, his omniscience, his glory, his majesty, his kingship, right? Yeah. This is what the music is supposed to do. I'm sorry to say it, but the popular forms of music, the profane forms of music, they, they work in the opposite direction. They take your mind away from those things and put them right back into the horizontal domain of the world. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a common anecdote that I've heard several times in, in different homilies with slight variations, but it's often uh, a story that's attributed to Gandhi, although I don't think Gandhi actually did say this. But uh, what is claimed is that he said something like, you Christians, you don't seem to believe what you claim to believe. If I believed what you say about the Eucharist, I would be crawling into the, the your places of worship on my hands and knees, but you're, you're not doing that. And whether he said that or not, I mean, there's a lot of truth to that. It's a scandal to non-Christians and non-Catholics that we treat that atmosphere with such casual indifference the way that we we do today. Okay, so I wanted to return to one, one more thing about this dichotomy between the sacred and the profane that, that Pope St. Pius X makes, because this is the thing that stuck with me after reading uh, that document. And I would encourage anybody to to take a look at it, Trialia Solicitudini. It's not very long. It's not very hard to read. Um, but one of the first things he says in uh, keeping within this paradigm of the sacred versus the profane is he talks about um, the profane, the introduction of the profane into the temple being something akin to uh, offering to God in our worship a substitute. Instead of it being something beautiful and sumptuous and worthy of the temple, it's like you were, were giving him the whip that that he then goes and cleanses the temple with. And, and think about that for a second, because think of who you think Jesus is in your heart and in your mind, this, this person that you have this very tender relationship with likely, right? And what's the one thing that moved him to violence? It was profaning the temple. It was in, and a lot of people don't get this about that that story. They think, oh, this is like an anti-capitalist story or something like that. It was because they were they were buying and selling. It's like, well, it wasn't just because he's against capitalism or something like that, which is not true. He was against the fact that this was a common thing being introduced into a sacred space that was so offensive to him that the only antidote to that was to to cleanse it violently. It was so offensive to him. Um, and that, that blew my mind. That made me think back to all the times where I was insisting on my wants and my preferences being in the Catholic mass. And it just like, it made me realize how, how seriously wrong that was. Um, yes. I don't know if you want to add to that point, but. I, I do. I, I think that, um, one point we should never forget, and it's made often enough, but I think it can never be made too often is that. The church can never compete with secular music. No. And yeah. nor should she. Nor, that's not the role. The role of the Catholic Church is not to compete with the United Nations when it comes to peace, uh, peace talks, or to compete with, um, with any industry, or let's say when it comes to climate control, you know, to be heavily involved in environmentalism and so on. This is not the, the purpose of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is the mystical body of Christ. It's the place where we are united to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for the salvation of our souls, for our eternal life in heaven, and for the resurrection of our bodies. Now, yes, all of that has social consequences. All of that has, it does have ecological consequences. I'm not denying that. And in fact, it has cultural consequences. If we really live in union with Christ and loving the things that our Lord loves, it will produce as an overflow beautiful culture this is what we see throughout europe this is why western europe is the most beautiful place in the world because it was absolutely permeated with catholicism and so even the way people made tables and chairs and knives and spoons and beer mugs and so on was beautiful because the faith elevated everyone's judgments and thoughts and desires to a level that it overflowed into the rest of life and their clothing and all sorts of common things right yeah, yeah. So the church will elevate and influence culture but at a time when culture has taken a decisive turn towards worldliness and towards secularism and really towards anti-christianity anti-religion anti-natural law i mean this is what we're seeing in hollywood in in the music industry in all sorts of of areas of modern western life that kind of culture um, cannot be emulated by the church must not be imitated by the church in any way 
that mm. that actually needs to be kept very much outside or if it's in it needs to be driven out as you were saying that christ did by the way there's evidence he did that twice that he there are two times when christ drove the money changer out a lot mm. of people realize that he didn't just do it once um and so yeah we the church cannot and should not try to compete with popular styles of art or music it, whatever whenever that happens christian rock i think you've probably said this yourself you know Christian rock is neither Christian nor rock. That is to say, it's not good rock music and it's not good Christian music either, right? It's just, no. it falls between two stools. It's this horrible in-between thing, you know? Yeah. It, and so the hard rocker is not going to appreciate it. And those whose minds are attuned to heavenly things and to virtue are not going to appreciate it either, or shouldn't, I would say. Um, you know, let me just read something to you. I want to read to yeah. you. I want to read to you two of my favorite verses from scripture. And these verses to me are like, if I could put them in gold letters on a plaque uh, and say, this is, this should be our ideal as Catholic worshipers and as music makers um, and music lovers. So the first one is, is Philippians four. Um, whatever is true Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is living, whatever is gracious. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Right? There's St. Paul mm. saying, let, let your mind dwell on these things and let everything you do be permeated with those qualities. Right? Um, that's what we see in traditional sacred music. I would say that's what we see in traditional western music in general um and then the other mm. favorite passage is romans 12 1 1 to 2 this is rotzinger's favorite passage i appeal to you brethren by the mercies of god to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to god which is your spiritual worship do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind yeah yeah i mean those those are beautiful I think that there are some people out there listening to this who are saying, yeah, that's all well and good. Um, I, I can agree to some degree with, with what you're saying, but Vatican II has spoken about this. Vatican II has told us that these foreign forms of music, just just like the, the pagan influences um, were adopted into the church in the, in the ancient world, um, so can modern secular forms of culture be adopted in today. Isn't that what, isn't that what um, Vatican II said to us? Um, and, and of course, people who say things like that, it's, it's, it's fairly obvious that they haven't read um, the, 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 the relevant documents in question. So Sacros Sacrosanctum Concilium is the, the relevant constitution that, that speaks to us about, about sacred music and, and, you you um, cut out an excerpt from that in your book that is extremely telling about what the council actually said. But maybe just give us an introduction to what what the emphasis of the council was on this question. Yes, well, the, the Second Vatican Council, the, the over two thousand fathers who talked about this question of uh, well, the liturgy in general, but also sacred music in particular, they they were nearly unanimous that. Uh, first of all, that Latin should be retained in the liturgy, not uh, not thrown out. And secondly, and more to the point, that Gregorian chant is the is the uh, music proper to the Roman rite. That's the language mm -hmm. we use, and therefore it should have chief place. The Latin is principem locum, chief place in liturgical services, because it's the music proper to the Roman rite. Um, and that was passed along with the document by nearly a unanimous vote, right? Um, that, but again, that shouldn't surprise us because the, the the council fathers, when they were talking about the liturgy, if you if you actually study the debates in the council, as I have done, and not just the final document, you can see that the the overwhelming majority of them had a conservative mentality. They did not want things to be radically changed. They wanted to they wanted to to do some I guess you could call them, in most respects, small modifications, some adjustments, a bit of enculturation in missionary territories. But in general, they reaffirmed the liturgical tradition of the Catholic Church, including Latin and chant, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Vatican II is, is really a red herring in this conversation. 
the the real scandal is that what what Vatican II taught was almost completely ignored by everybody. And why was that? Mainly, I would say, because of intellectual fashion, because of changing fashions. 1968, everything blows up. You know, uh, half the the Jesuits are Marxists by that time. I mean, everybody is talking crazy radical ideas by the time the late 60s roll around. And the council was a dead letter, practically. That's that's what people don't realize. Now, Mm -hmm. sitting back in their comfortable living room and reading Vatican II, oh, isn't that nice? They don't realize that within a few years after the council, it was mostly a dead letter, right? In terms mm-hmm. of the actual life of the church. Okay, so it it endorses Gregorian chant. Um, at best, it leaves the door open to the possibility of other forms. Um, I think that's even a stretch. That's 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 open to interpretation. But yeah, go ahead. Well, what it says is uh, that chant is proper to the Roman rite and therefore should yeah. have chief place. But other forms of music, especially polyphony, so referring yeah. now to the great Renaissance polyphony of composers like Palestrina, other forms of music, especially polyphony, can also have a place as long as they accord with the spirit of the liturgical action. Right. Well, what does that mean? It just goes back to our whole conversation about profane versus sacred, what's appropriate for the marketplace versus the temple of God. And so forth. Yeah, and it also it also singles out the pipe organ as the principal uh, church instrument, and and right. and says it should have equivalently a, a pride of place in the instruments used in church. It never mentions the piano. It certainly never mentions the guitar, um, and 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 for good reason. All of the other documents that the church published before and after Sacrosanct and Concilium warned against using instruments that were mainly associated with profane music, with secular Mm. entertainment music. Well, the guitar, the folk guitar played in a folksy way with strumming chords, was associated only with the anti-Vietnam war protesters and people like that, right, at the time that Vatican II met. Mm. That was never a sacred instrument. Uh, It had never been accepted in the church. And so when the church says, don't use worldly instruments, they certainly have the guitar in mind. Pius X yeah. in Trales Licitudini explicitly excludes the piano as a liturgical instrument. He, he mm-hmm. mentions it by name because it existed obviously back when he wrote it in the early 20th century. And he and that aspect of Trales Licitudini was never rescinded or contradicted by any subsequent church document. Mm-hmm. I mean, and so I, I, I actually argue in my book that the piano is still forbidden as a church instrument. I mean, it would be forbidden anyway by these more general principles that we're talking about, because piano, what's the piano? Piano is a concert hall instrument. It's a jazz lounge instrument. It's not in any way, shape, or form a church instrument. Um, You know, I think even from a legal point of view, you could make the argument that it has no place in church. Yeah, no, well said. Okay, so Gregorian chant then is heavily endorsed it's it's elevated to the highest form. It's part of what the council calls the, a treasure of inestimable value. Um, I, I I don't think they they could speak about it, speak about it any more highly um, than they do. Um, so to try to introduce anything else, I, to me, just seems incredibly disobedient to what the will of of the council fathers were. But so let's talk about Gregorian chant. Why, uh, other than appeals to authority? Um, and it, it's not a, a, that's not a fallacy. This is an authority that all Catholics should recognize, the magisterium. Um, so we can appeal to that authority and say, well, this is what the church has endorsed. This is what the church has said. This should be the, the appropriate form uh, of music. Um, why, why logically or, or rationally can we say that, that Gregorian chant is, is the most fitting? Yes, exactly. I mean, when the church says that it's the most fitting, She's just giving voice to an unbroken tradition. And the tradition mm-hmm. is what it is for rational reasons. It's not just a yeah. random, you know, like the Holy Spirit was asleep and the church was wrong for all this time. And, oh, now suddenly we realize we were wrong for thousands of years. No, that's not the way it works. I think the reason why chant is special, it has a lot of special qualities. The first is that it is totally in service of the word of God. I mean, nearly every single Gregorian chant is taken straight from scripture so you don't have weird lyrics as you do with a lot of modern church hymns. I mean, you can have well-written hymns too. We know that. I'm not. I'm not bashing on hymns as such. But all of the words of chant, nearly all of the words, are drawn from sacred scripture, from the Word of God. 
and the the chant itself is so pure and so simple it's one melodic line it has it's a beautiful melodic line it's often very elaborate but nevertheless it's it's like a musical lexio divina of sacred scripture that's how i like to think of it you know lexio divina is when you prayerfully study and ponder the bible and these composers of these chants were doing that. They were monks. Their whole life was to prayerfully ponder the Bible. Uh, well, not their whole life, but I mean, that was a large part of their life, in addition to worship, liturgy. Uh, and so these chants were born out of that prayerful encounter with the Word of God. And you can really hear that. I give some examples in the book, some actual concrete examples of how, how, how richly the chant illuminates the meaning of Scripture. Um, and yes, this, it's true, the chants are written in Latin, so there, if this is not instant, immediate comprehension we're talking about. We're talking about a lifelong apprenticeship. That's the way that, mm. that Christian worship has always been seen, as something you grow into over many years. You mature in it. You, you don't expect to have instant gratification when, when it comes to liturgy. If I don't understand it all right away with my puny mind, then I'm leaving. You know, the church has failed. That's ridiculous. That's absurd. Nobody ever thought about it that way before. Um, so primacy of the word of God, that's the first thing. Also the free rhythm of the chant. See, chant floats mm -hmm. along, it kind of meanders. Um, I, I like to compare it to the motion of waves or birds flying. Because, and why is that? Because it doesn't fit into a metrical straight jacket. It's yeah. not in three, four time, four, four time, two, four time. It's not like a march or a waltz or any other kind of dance, right? It, it, it floats along with the natural rhythm of the words of scripture. And what that, the effect that that has is, is very powerful, but also very subtle. In other words, it, it, it lifts your mind and heart to thoughts of God and thoughts of heaven. Um, and it doesn't make you tap your toe, which is kind of working in the opposite direction. Whereas if you hear a band start up and they're playing this groovy, you know, Dave Brubeck sort of thing, you know, uh, and that, completely shifts your attention more to the bodily enjoyment that you have from the from the music and that might be fine at a jazz picnic but that's not what we're doing when we go to to church um and then those are the main things those are the primacy of the word the free rhythm the modes chant is written in eight different modes uh, and without getting too technical that just means that the the shape of the melodies is going to sound very different to our modern mm -hmm. ears because they, they're they so ancient that they come from a world before the invention of major and minor keys. So mm -hmm. all of our music, you know, even people who don't know anything about music theory have probably heard of major and minor keys, you know, and all of our music is written in major and minor keys. But chant and, and ancient music of most world cultures is not written in major and minor keys. It's written in modes. And so what happens is that the melodies themselves have this kind of haunting incomplete at times um you know greatly sad feeling to them to use a byzantine expression uh that mm. is applied to icons right and so it's it, again it emphasizes that otherworldliness of the chant but this is not you know your neighborhood music mm. this is not your grandmother's music this is your you know great 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 grandmother's music right so it's and the the ancientness of it there isn't experienced i would say as um, as like nostalgic time travel, like looking at black and white photos from the 40s, it's a timeless feeling that you get from the yeah. Um And in fact, yeah. it there's a universality to it. Yeah. And it passed through, you know, think about all the different centuries and generations and political revolutions and famines and wars and so on that chant passed through. It doesn't belong to any age. It's not we're not going back to the 14th century. It's every age and no age. It's timeless music. It's the church's mm -hmm. own music, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you could mention other little things like it's sung in unison, which is a very beautiful, it makes it easier to sing and it also makes it symbolic of the unity of the church. Um, it's generally unaccompanied, which means that we're using the God-given instrument uh, rather than uh, relying upon so much upon other instruments, especially amped up instruments. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's anonymous. We don't know who wrote most of the chants. So nobody gets the credit, Marty Haugen, whatever. Nobody gets the credit for the chant. It's just everybody's and nobody's, you know. Um, I don't think people realize how disruptive to uh, the the liturgy it is to have all of this music owned by publishers. 
Um, yeah. It's like it, it, it's it's really kind of robbing the people of their culture to, to some degree and, and profiteering off of it, which is what most of these published books that sit in our pews actually do. And it, it, it creates all kinds of havoc with our ability to actually just celebrate our liturgies uh, without worrying about these kinds of things and, and, and being told that we're, oh, you're not allowed to do that because I need to get my cut of that, right? It's just like, oh, yes. come on, really? Is that what we're doing? I'm going to just mention two last things about chant. Yeah. Uh, because yep. topic, but you can see, I hope you can see, as I'm giving this description, just how different chant is from any other kind of music, right? Mm. Um, it, it has, a, I would say, one of its special traits is emotional purity and moderation. W what I mean by that is it, it is, it has emotions. I've been singing chant now for 30, over 30 years. I'm very well aware of all the different um all the different moods and all the different feelings that chants can evoke. Um, not all chants are alike. The chants during Passion Week or during Holy Week are very different from the Easter chants, from Pentecost, from Christmas. They all have their own character, their own flavor. Mm. But it's all it's all um, it's it's more interior. It's more it's it's not the kind of music that works you up and makes you want to like spin around and shout. It's the kind of music that that makes you restful. It it mm -hmm. it makes you calm. It mm -hmm. it makes you go inside your soul, which is the temple where the Holy Trinity dwells. It makes you pay attention more to the symbols of the liturgy and the actions of the ministers and the words. It makes you, I would say, it makes you more receptive, which is very important. That's the critical yeah. merit uh, virtue that we need to have for good worship is to be receptive, um, which should also be. Uh, indicated in how we receive communion kneeling and on the tongue but that's a whole separate topic um mm. <laughs> what we're trying to do what the church is trying to do in worship i would say is give us um another way of seeing and another way of hearing the world um mm. and and chant helps us to hear god and to hear the things of god in a different way in a way that we won't get from anywhere else um and finally the chant is just unambiguously sacred what I mean by that is it grew up with the church. It grew up with the liturgy. It had no other function, no other purpose. There was never such a thing as secular chant. I mean, not not in the way that we think of, of, of Gregorian chant. It was always just purely for the service of God. And that's why, I think that's why movie makers have such a deep instinct when they want to show the Catholic church, they, they have when they want to have a scene in a Catholic church, there's almost always some Gregorian chant wafting yeah. in the background. Yeah. You know, not like a bunch of guitars playing, because that doesn't right. sound much, right? And even Hollywood can get this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I there's so much more we could say about this, and I I would love to spend all day talking about it, but um, we'll 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 try to wrap it up here. Um, the book is Good Music, Sacred Music, and Silence by Peter Kwasniewski. Is that am I saying that right? Kwasniewski. Okay, good. Um. Any any closing remarks or, or advice you'd want to give to people who are persuaded by what we've been talking about today? Yes, I, I would just say, hark, harking back to something we talked about at the beginning of our interview, um, experience. Ex, you know, um, expertus potest credere, it says in, in Jesu Dolce's Memoria, it says experience uh, is able to to believe, right? What 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 we need is to immerse ourselves in greatness and goodness. I mean, that's how we acquire virtue. We have to immerse ourselves. We have to surround ourselves by good people, by good books, by good literature, movies, music. We have to surround ourselves with good influences so that what we're consuming will actually nourish us and make us better people. And I would say the same thing about liturgy. It's not just, it's not enough to go to a Latin mass once and listen to some chant or go to a low mass and pray for a half an hour on your knees. That's good. You got to start somewhere. But you need to do it a bunch of times to acquire new habits, to kind of retool the way that you're listening and what you're listening for and what you're seeing. And I think that I mean, your experience, my experience, and that of many other people has been that there's a moment when there's a shift that takes place and you have a kind of conversion of mind, a metanoia, you know, a, a change of mind. And you start to realize, oh, yes, the tradition of the church, there was a, there is a deep wisdom there. There's a reason why things were done this way for such a long time. It's not just that people were lacking creative ideas, it's because they were right. 
and what they did made sense. So that's what I encourage people to to shift mm-hmm. from the realm of just my opinion, your opinion, my taste, your taste, and have the have challenged themselves yeah. to try to see and hear the way the tradition has seen and heard. And I think that uh, that there will be very surprising and positive results from that. Yeah, well, thank you for saying that. And, and if it only ever comes down to asserting our taste versus others' taste, there really is no solution to that. We're always just going to be caught in conflict. But by appealing to our reason to understand why chant is so appropriate to the magisterium's endorsement of it, I think we do have a way out of this perpetual conflict over the liturgy wars. So, so Peter, thank you for taking the time to uh, explain this to us and to teach us about it and for writing your book. Um, for those of you watching, thanks for, for tuning in. Uh, God willing, we'll see you again soon. Hey, thanks for watching that. If you made it this far, it's either because you fell asleep or because you really like me. And if it's the latter, I feel okay asking if you would consider helping me out by subscribing, liking, sharing. And if you really like me, consider supporting my channel by joining the reinforcements where you can get opportunities to interact with me and others personally. You can sign up at brianholdsworth.com .ca. And if you're looking to buy or move, consider using Real Estate for Life. They are a network of real estate agents that will share your pro-life and pro-family beliefs, which are pretty important when it comes to making a big decision like finding a house. You can find them at realestateforlife.ca.